Hi, podcast listeners. Today's episode is a best of compilation pulled from the Fine Home Building podcast archives. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Enjoy. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Editorial Director Justin Fink. Hi, guys. Rob Wadsack, Digital Brain Manager. Howdy. And Producer Jeff Rose. Hello. Please email us your questions at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. So Bradley from Ferndale, uh, Michigan, which is just north of Detroit, writes, gentlemen, I wanted to pick your brain regarding the installation of the zip system in a partial remodel. We're getting ready to begin a renovation to a 1951 bung- bungalow. The scope is generally interior, but we will be removing the back half of the roof to create a full width dormer on the second floor to add a bathroom. The obvious choice is to clad the new dormer wall and roof and zip system and then install shingles and siding. However, I have some concerns that there will be negative ramifications to having only a portion of the structure so well sealed and much better insulated. I've not done exploratory demo, but I'm guessing the interior walls are all 2 by 4 construction with little to no insulation. They likely have slat sheathing, maybe a conventional house wrap and vinyl siding. The interior walls are plaster on lath. The roof is constructed with asphalt shingles on OSB. Again, minimal insulation. Would you take a more conventional approach to match or proceed with zip system? No plans to swap the existing vinyl siding and upgrade insulation, uh, and the sheathings exist yet. So, and he's in zone five. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip <clears throat> right past his actual question. Um, the answer for me being. Yes, do it. Do it do the it. way it should be done going forward and go right to the part that I'm more concerned about, which is the full width dormer on the back. Please don't make it go full, full width. width. I want <laughs> it looks so bad when you do that. Just set yeah. it in a foot, even my, a foot. My wife, uh, Carol, calls that the greedy dormer. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's name. a great name for it. Can we call this episode the greedy dormer? <laughs> I mean, this kind of goes <laughs> the greedy dormer. Okay, I'm going to put that on, on the notes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it kind of goes back to the beginning. We were talking about it. You know, why people, houses. you know why people do the greedy dormer, though? Yeah. Because those little cheek walls and the little runs of sh- roof shingles are a complete pain in the butt. You need to think about what it looks like on the outside, though, too. It matters. Yeah. It matters. It looks like a weird behemoth box when you have a full I, width. I oh, totally agree. I, I, do know, I do know why people do it, though. It is a colossal pain. Now, if you have roof, if you have overhanging roof on the eaves, it's a lot easier because you can, you can almost... It still still looks pretty bad, but you can get away with it more being in line with the, the what, e-falls. What about a, applied rakes? Is that a is that a solution for you? It's not. A, I mean, it, it, that helps. For we sure. should tell what people what that is. So, the the dormer walls and the rest of the house walls align, but then you apply like a fake overhang mm-hmm. halfway up the wall slope to make it look like it's it's part inter- of the roof, like as, as if the dormer is intersected yeah. by the roof. Yeah. Right. So and that's that, a, like second best, and that's really. Like, there's no downside to doing that. It's extremely good for the weather resistance of your house to have overhangs. We've done articles in the yes. past, and, it, and like, if you looked at the research on it, it's shocking how even, effective even small overhangs and are. And even, like, inches, really screwed up, uh, yeah. Yeah. stucco installations that have good overhangs yeah. will perform. Yep. It's really the best thing to make your house last if you live in a wet place. Yeah, yeah. If, if you look at a lot of the architectural details on older buildings, the freeze boards and the lintels and all that stuff, that stuff, as beautiful as a lot of it was, was there for a reason. It was to keep right. water away from the seams. Not so much on colonials. No, no, they didn't. They, they, they were just, but back they were then. They were building frame, so it was yeah, difficult. And, and also, they were also building the simplest houses they could possibly yes. build with the least amount of materials. Correct. And I think cape houses, which don't have any right. overhangs, were meant to be more aerodynamic too. If you had big overhangs, the roof would blow off in a gale. So. Yeah, and the thing is, these these architectural details that might have had a purpose at some time are carried over to modern houses without any thought of what, why, you know. They're just, it's just, that's the look. A colonial house or a cape has no overhang, so that's why people just keep reproducing that That look. might be one of my favorite parts of building is, like, the etymology, the origins of of th- stuff that we do. Like, why do we, why do we have baseboards? Like, that kind of, Why know, do we have two-story foyers? 
Yeah, well, no, I don't, you can't. You can't start. You can't start in two thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Why do we have round arch top windows? But you know, like looking at the profile of crown molding and how that was modeled after what a gutter looked like on the outside of a house. Like those kinds of things are really interesting to dig into. It helps you make more informed decisions about when you want to abandon the script and go your own direction. You know. Yes. Instead of just following suit. Yep. Yeah, and, and and back to the the dormer thing about the overhangs is that uh, chances are pretty good when someone's building one of these dormers that it's on the back of the house where they're going to have a deck or a patio or a porch. So maybe having a little overhang is going to be a nice thing there anyway because there's going to be some doors mm -hmm. leading out onto the back. In fact, maybe even consider building it as a porch. You might also consider, um, if you've <clears> ever <throat> seen or look up images of uh – doghouse dormers that are in series and they have with little, a shed roof little in between, shed roof between. Yeah. What are they that's called? handsome nantucket i don't know or something there's some a pair of doghouse dormers with a, a shed dormer in between of various widths right? right and you can do three dormers you know three doghouse with two shed roofs i mean it, it, they look really classy building doghouse dormers stinks <laughs> <laughs> i've never had to do it i've just been there when oh, it's being man, done oh man it's yep. so so much work for so little thing oh i think it's yeah. so cool it well, is cool. Well, you know, while you're at it, why don't you do one of those nice curved eyebrow dormers, you know? I love those that don't, like, actually do anything. They're just into the attic. So it's purely just an exercise. My parents have, one, have a doghouse dormer. It, it would definitely tax the builder. Like, you can tell that they'd never done one and they were working through it. Yeah. You know? It's just... It's really it's, handsome looking. It's, yeah. it's the right thing, but it's hard to build. Yes. This uh, next question <clears throat> comes from Dan from West Haven, Connecticut. Hi, fellas, long-time listener and DIYer. My home was a complete gut job that I did mostly on my own. There's nothing like listening to FHB podcasts while doing home projects. Well, I couldn't agree more. Here's my latest issue. The finished portion of my basement floor is coated with speckled epoxy coating and covered by foam mats like a martial arts studio. Very soon after installing the mats, condensation began accumulating in spots under them. I bought dimpled underlayment thinking that the additional air circulation would prevent the condensation, but it hasn't. There is never bulk water, and due to the epoxy coating, I find it hard to believe that the moisture is working its way through the concrete and the coating. This basement used to be carpeted, and the carpet padding was glued directly to the concrete, and it was never moist. The room is primarily an exercise and laundry space, hence the matting. The walls are insulated with 1-inch XPS glued to the walls, then R15 Roxel. The room is conditioned with central heat and AC. I run a dehumidifier for a few hours per day, and it's unclear whether or not that is helping. I know this is a rather unconventional floor system, but do you have any ideas and or products to help prevent this? Should I be cleaning slash mopping up this condensation when it happens, or is it okay to let it sit and dry on its own? I hope I've provided enough info. Mm, this is a cool one. So my guess is that this is the same kind of problem that you have when you put foam sheathing in your walls and you don't air seal it well. You've got a cold surface on the uh, on the outside on the damp side. Right. The slab and, is the cold surface. Yeah, and you're not and the fact that these tiles have gaps every couple of feet, you're allowing moist air to get in there and condense underneath the foam. Right. And especially now that the dimple mat is there, that, right? That it's makes, got even that more almost flow. makes it worse. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you so you, in an attempt to use the dimple mat to create enough airflow to pick up the moisture again, your, it, which is a, a valiant effort. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's really just allowing more air to get there to condense. It, it just nails home how um, how complicated and but at the same time sort of simple this some of these problems are. This is pretty simple problem because it's like you're. It's kind of like the same thing where people say, "Oh, I open my uh, basement door in the summer to get all that moist air out of there." <laughs> You know, you're, you're yeah. doing the same thing. You're, you're basically... Did I tell you guys about the time I tried to dry my basement floor by running a fan on it and directing upstairs air to it, thinking it was warmer? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what happened? It got wetter? I kept saying, why is this getting wetter? I've been drying this for hours. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so... so I got to tell you, so many people think that open the door and, and let it or dry. Or open your let basement windows. And it's like, yeah. yeah. So when I bought my house, my the guy who sold it to me said, you know, I made these fixed panes of glass for the basement hopper windows. He's like, you're going to want to replace those, you know, because you're going to want to be able to open up the, the windows to let the space dry out. And I'm like, no, I am not going to. I don't want to. I'm going to caulk do, them closed. I'm going to never touch those fixed you know windows. What, you know what is the scariest thing about this is, is that our building codes have, have it, yes. used to have it wrong. Yes. Like vented crawl spaces. Yep. 
it makes like, no sense. You have to put that vent in there, even though as soon as that inspector leaves, you're going to put a piece of rigid foam yep. in that hole. Yep. And that's the smart thing to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so in this situation, um, you know, you guys know that I used to work in uh, everything. The, yeah, well, everything. <laughs> we used to work where we were doing like retail in- environments where we were building like trade show booths and yeah, and, we're sick of hearing about it. But <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but we you're used, so impressive. We, no, but we used. Um, roll out rubber matting that's continuous yeah and you can buy that a lot of the gyms instead of using these foam puzzle tiles will you buy huge rolls of that well that's a good idea but what do you do about the edges because it's you're gonna leak in there so what i would probably use is is gaffer's tape tape it down that's where you put all your weights right hold the edges yeah that's right but seriously i I was um, gonna say that uh just run the dehumidifier more. He says he's running a few hours a day, which is just not enough. It's got to run all the time. Yeah. And there's an energy penalty associated with that. And you got to make sure your basement is separate from the rest of the living space. Otherwise, you're trying to dehumidify the whole house. And if you have windows open, you're trying to dehumidify the outdoors as well. So you got to kind of create the basement its own little environment. Is yeah. Gaffer's tape air? That's got to be air permeable. We need our video expert. Okay. Jeff's in the room. Is Gaffer's, Gaffer's tape, tape is air pretty, permeable? It's pretty open. I would think so, yeah. If you um, haven't used gaffer's tape, it is pretty awesome. Okay, yeah. you got to get some. Black Ga- tape? Yeah, gaffer's tape is like, you think duct tape is cool? Gaffer's yeah. tape is so much Jeff, cooler. isn't there like what, What's the best like one, one, Jeff? We've had a talk, yeah. Well, well Permacel, but they're out of business. But oh, oh, man. Oh, man. You old school video guys. So what's the one you've been buying more lately, recently? <laughs> uh, Pro Gaff. Pro Gaff. There you go. Okay. But the you nice, here. The nice thing about everything. gaffer's tape, it sticks to everything. It, the glue lasts longer than and the it's glue. black. The, well, you can get all different colors, but <laughs> really, yeah. But then the the glue lasts longer than duct tape, and it doesn't get all like gummed up. Right, and you, you can pe- pull it you off. Pull it off, and it doesn't make a mess. Right, it's cool. expensive though. Yeah, it is expensive, but yeah. it does. But you look job. awesome. Yeah. So I don't know. I, it basically there's two things you need to like Patrick said, keep the moisture from other places from getting into the space. Like it's probably you know. Around the, you might even want to put um, weather, weather stripping, stripping around on the basement your basement door, door yep. or just like we were talking about earlier, do a blower door. Or yeah, just but look. he's still running heat down there, so I mean, there's still going to be moisture in the air. Especially yep. he's at a gym, he's probably down there pumping iron. Yep. You know, he's splashing water yeah. on his head. Yeah, just breathing. Yeah, doing bucket sweating. challenges and things. Laundry's there too. Get the laundry. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Get but, Jeff uh, laying in. He's got a little rock climbing gym in the background. I mean, really, that basically you got to. Do as is much this, as you can is this a crisis? Moist. This is not a crisis. There's it, re- the thing is, this nothing's going to happen. It yeah, can no. get wet. It can dry. Nothing. It's going to be yeah. a little the, gross. The only under risk there. is if it gets dirty in the water, and you're going to have mold under there. Right. right. This yeah. is this is kind of the kind of thing where we say that um, it gets wet, and the materials don't care. They can, it, it's like concrete. Concrete can yeah. get to, wet uh, all day. I wanted to confirm that. So he said this is epoxy uh, coating, and, and it might be, but there are acrylic coatings that look. Um, <laughs> They look very similar. In fact, I did an uh, article with a guy who used an acrylic coating instead of uh, this epoxy, right? Yep. There's some advantages. <clears throat> of w- using acrylic? Yeah. One of them is that at very th- thin thicknesses, it is somewhat vapor permeable. Mm-hmm. But the, the guy I talked to, uh, Tom Hall at Associated Concrete Coatings, told me that they are rare and it's unlikely that it is almost certainly water from the air not mm-hmm. coming through the concrete. But there's always that test you can do with that where you tape down a piece of polyethylene to the floor, and if it sweats underneath when it's after it's taped down, then the moisture is coming from below. So you heard it from Rob. But you got to tape, tape it so it's airtight, right? Yes. yes. Tape it so it's airtight so you know that none of that, that moisture is coming from the air in the room. And if the tape won't stick to the slab, then you know the slab's wet. <laughs> <laughs> Not really helpful, but... Or dirty and moldy. Yeah. I think that's a great question. Yeah. And I yeah. like the space. I think that's a cool space. Yeah. You know what? And it's going to be, it's really interesting for all of these systems like uh, dry core, you know, the little panels, the dimpled panels yeah, yeah. It, that a lot of people are using. And it's the same sort of situation there. It's, it's not helping, maybe. It's not, well, it's, <laughs> like there's not as much harm of it getting wet because now you have a plastic subfloor raised subfloor and you have a slab but it's also not solving the problem yeah no i think it's and it's, it like you said any little yeah. material under there like maybe the label on those panels if it's tacked to the underside and it's and it's made out of paper it's yeah. gonna get moldy that's mold the, food i mean that's the key i mean i've got a damp basement for half the year and 
the way I deal with mold down there is just eliminate every material that's moldy. Like if things come in a plastic, a cardboard box, I put them in a plastic bin and with a, with a lid on it so that yeah. you're not and keep stuff off the floor. Yeah, right. And it's a different <clears throat> system. I mean, people might say, well, what about all these dimpled membranes people put in basements, like continuous? That's the, that's the difference, though. Continuous. Rob Yeager did this, and under his basement floor, yeah, there is no connection between the potentially moldy cavern cavity. Between the slab and the, and the, house. And the floor, yeah. and it's not connected to your air supply or house. It's so just, you tape the perimeter too. Yeah, yeah. it's totally yeah. sealed. Yeah, the key the key is not letting moist air into a space that is colder than the room you're in. So it's that was a very, how are you going to stop moist air from getting in? No, there, but what I'm saying is like you're saying with that dimple mat under a slab or under a finished oh, yeah. floor, that is air sealed at yes. the edges, and so in this situation, like like we said, it's it's maybe not as much of a concern if you're not actually seeing mold. Right. But if it if it's a problem, run the dehumidifier, seal the space from the rest of the house as best you can. Try to sweat less. Yeah. <laughs> do you, Patrick? Do you remember Diami's dad's house had this stuff all over the floor, and he was like at water level in the South Shore of Long Island, like fifty feet from Long Island from from the Great South Bay, and it was his had, wood shop, right? And he had a sump pump running in there. Like I don't know how he avoided <laughs> that being a total moldy mess. It was a it was a submarine practically. <laughs> This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Associate Editor Matt Milham. Hello. Colin Russell, Director of Video. Hello there. And Producer Jeff Rose. Hey. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. Should we get to Spencer's question? Do it. Uh, Spencer writes, I recently purchased a home in northern Illinois. It was built in 1989 as the model home for the community. It's a beautiful masonry fireplace. My wife and I love to use it as often as we can. However, there is no fresh air or makeup air in the back of the chimney. So the only air I have to feed this fire and send it up to flue is already conditioned air in my house. So uh, I've asked two different contractors in two different fireplace stores to install a vent, and they act like I've got rabbit ears or something growing out of my head. So he wants them to construct uh, a makeup air supply uh, close to the firebox. He says, I'm starting to feel like Will Ferrell and Zoolander. It's all the same look. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills or something. Have you seen this movie? I did. That's a really (laughs) funny scene where he does the crazy pill thing. (laughs) I should maybe watch that. So his question is, this is a thing, right? Any idea how I can stop sending money up the flu? I would say don't burn your fireplace. Yeah. Yeah. Tap it off. (laughs) Get one of those. I don't think that's what he wants. He likes the fireplace. and you can blame him. Inserts. Yeah. No. So what is the problem here that at work, Matt? Uh, you've been digging into this in reference to this story, right? Yeah. Well, fireplaces and tight houses are kind of a bad idea. Like you're always going to be sending a lot of air up the chimney, and those those flues are pretty big. Um, <laughs> I mean, yes, no, you're talking uh, of hundreds of CFM, right? Yeah. So I mean, you know, uh, one idea is to open a window um, to provide some makeup air, but Code actually, but he's not having trouble with the thing drafting or working, so right. it's 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 not going to help. Right, that. so that's not going to help that. But you know, he's that's going to supply his makeup air too. You mm-hmm. know, I, I mean, but I, you're going to be sending air up. You're not going to be able to supply enough makeup air to this probably to to make up for the amount of air that's going up the flue. Um, this mason that we worked with, he did put uh, makeup air because it's actually required in the IRC that you you provide makeup air to fireplaces now. Really? Yeah. So Since when? I, I don't know. I haven't gone back through all the huh. versions of the code, but it, it there is a provision in there uh, that basically says you have to have this. I was poking around 2012 this morning for this very mm-hmm. reason, and I did not see any uh, mention of uh, makeup air, so that might be a newer provision. Yeah. That's usually the code cycle I start with, because like, that's the most common one in, yeah. a, in a that's accepted. And I, I probably should have started there. I was I started with 2018. So Are there even any states people, on 2018? I don't know. I think Maryland is probably the only one who adopts it as a uh, statute. Yeah. But anyway, the, the, the makeup air intake that he put in um, was, I want to say, about, what, two and a half inches? Yeah, he was calling it round. three. I believe it was two yeah. and a half inch pipe. Yeah. So nominal three inch <laughs> two and a half inch pipe and you need to move hundreds your, of your cubic flu is feet. probably like 16 by something <laughs> like you're, it's not you're, an equivalent hole. A, yeah it's not an equivalent hole yeah i mean what strikes me here is like typically when we hear fireplace problems right it's backdrafting 
Right? right. The house is getting depressurized from the dryer or what have you. Mm -hmm. He's not really having a problem. He doesn't need makeup air. It's functioning fine. At least yeah. he's not saying it doesn't. Yes. Yeah. So it's really almost a theoretical one. Could you supply makeup air enough so that it won't draw on the house and suck the heat on the house, right? Well, is, is that what he's getting at? Yeah, and actually, I, I should say the, the supply air isn't required if you have mechanical systems that are providing makeup air and either creating like a, like a neutral pressure or a positive pressure in the house so that you're not backdrafting. Um, so, yeah, you can, <laughs> if you've got some kind of mechanical system, you can get away with not having... Uh, the makeup air in the firebox itself. But right, but I mean, he's getting away with it now. Like, yeah, he, it's, it's functioning fine. What his right. concern is really, isn't the air that it's burning going up the uh, yeah the it, chimney, the condition air? So could he sort of sidestep that and give it sort of a, another pathway to breathe from? And it, yeah, and I, I'm like, if you do that, wouldn't you then want to put a glass door on the front to really separate it from the house? That's mm. my solution is to. Get the fireplace all together and get a wood stove insert, right? Yeah, because there a wood stove is much more efficient than a than a fireplace, mm -hmm. and it it doesn't have the problem that uh, it's pulling. It's fireplaces increase air leakage because that air has to be replaced somehow. So it's coming from somewhere because there is this great pressure of air driving that movement in. So a wood stove doesn't have that. It's much more controlled combustion. So, but you don't get the pretty flames, right? You have to look at the flames through a door. Yeah. And if you put a, a door on a fireplace, uh, again, because most of the heat coming out of there is radiant heat, I think a lot of that's going to end up getting reflected off the glass. Mm. So uh, it's not going to work. It, it, it won't work as well, probably, as you want it to. No. I say just burn more wood and heat the house that way. Yeah. Hotter, faster fires. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to... The thing is, yes, it is a thing, and there are retrofit options. I think Vestal makes at least one that's like a, a makeup air thing that you can put in the back of, of an existing fireplace. It seems like a big job to cut a hole in the bottom of a hearth and root the yeah, piping. You're, and you're going like, through a minimum of eight inches of masonry. Of stuff, power. yeah. That's just for the firebox, plus whatever the ch <laughs> like the chimney structure and all that is. Yeah, so. it's, I, don't, I don't see it as being practical. I really don't. Mm -hmm. On the firebox, we saw like that, the unit he installed, the little breather unit, uh, he put it like dead center, about four or five, four or five blocks. Two courses high. Two courses high. Yeah. And yeah, it was built integral. Yeah. It was bricked in. Yeah, I it, can't it, imagine yeah. getting back in there ever. Right. Yeah. And that's, I, that's how most of them are installed. Like it, you have to put them in, but a lot of them you have to put in while you're building the fireplace. But the, there is, there are retrofit <laughs> there are mason saws. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you can get a gigantic like a... coring bit. <laughs> How are you going to fit that in the firebox? I mean, I suppose yeah. you could drill from the bottom up, but it just like I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I think that's why the people at the fireplace store are looking at you like you have rabbit's ears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fireplace is functioning fine. You're not getting smoke in the house. Right. You're probably. He's probably in the best place he can be. If you want to uh, spend fewer of your, you know, conditioned heating dollars uh, and sending an, um, them up the flue, you need a, to get a wood stove insert and put it in there, and it'll yeah. be a way more efficient. And close, it, close the damper when you're not using it. Close the damper when you're not using it. All right. Well, that seemed pretty easy. Do either of you guys have a fireplace? No. Do you have one? I do, and I capped it off. I put a... <laughs> I put a... a, a, a tile the size of the flu on top of it and caulked it in with masonry caulk. <laughs> Your home inspector is going to cite that as a problem someday when you go to sell the house, I I'll suspect. Just, you can just cut it off real yeah. easy. I, uh, I lived in a house for a while with a fireplace, and it was pretty cool, but I, I don't think it's a good way to heat. No. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Associate Editor Matt Milham. Hey, Patrick. Nice to see you, Matt. And Rob Watsag, Digital Brain Manager. Hello. Welcome, Rob. Thanks. This is from uh, Blake from Northern Vermont. Hi, all. I'd like to hear your opinions on products to seal end cuts. So when you cut cross-cut lumber, you expose the uh, capillary tubes in the wood structure, and it'll take on water, and that action will make it moldy and rot, right? I bought anchor seal for the end cuts of a timber frame porch I built last summer on my place. I used it both on particularly vulnerable spots of the PT deck framing and the green hemlock posts. 
My father-in-law, a cabinet maker, insists that it's useless since it's wax-based. He says that it will eventually just evaporate. He prefers to soak the end cut in oil before installing. Do you think he means like motor oil? I think he might probably need some penetrating oil finish or something like that. No? I don't know. Could be oil. I know, uh, or at least apocryphally know. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've heard of uh, farmers in Vermont using used motor oil as a stain on their outbuildings yeah. because it's something you have, and it probably does a pretty good job of protecting the wood, although the toxicity for uh, uh, is not a good thing, so please don't do that. So I uh, salvaged um, a barn once to use for the siding on the barn that I yeah. currently have my shop in, and did it smell like it motor oil? It smelled like it was drenched in motor oil. <laughs> there you yeah. go. I mean, it was a machine shop, so yeah. maybe it was just from them working on tractors in there, but it so was I, like... So I don't know what kind of oil he's talking yeah. about, but I don't know if that's important to our conversation here. Uh, Blake writes, I know there are specific products for PTN cuts, but what do you guys think is best for untreated wood, like my green hemlock or the cedar decking or cedar siding? And what if primer isn't an option because the wood will be stained with an oil-based stain and not painted? So how do you seal end cuts if you're staining the material is his question, which is a good one. Do I just junk, dunk it in stain and move on with your day? That's what I'd say. Mm. I don't know. Well, I mean, it depends on what that stain is. I mean, if he's talking about a tinted oil finish, maybe that'd be fine. I mean, uh, I think a water-based uh, stain, solid or semi-transparent, would be the yeah. preferred thing, too. If you're not doing anything to it, I would say what you did with the waxed-based sealer is a good solution. Anchor seal is fine. What do you guys think about this before I tell you what I Ethan have, Biederman, our timber framer, said? I don't really know. The anchor seal, my understanding is, like, sawyers will use that, like, when they first fell a log, if they're not going to be able to mill it right away. To they'll, prevent checks? Yeah, to prevent checking. Yep. And so I, it seems like it works in that. <laughs> I don't know how long it lasts like that. I mean, I don't know if you can leave that log out there for years like that. I mean, I know that like decking for like Ipe or mahogany that, uh, especially because Ipe will like check that some guys I know who have built decks with that stuff say that they, they rely on some kind of wax based Anchor product. Anchor seal was yeah. the one I remember yeah. for Ipe specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so anything you can do to keep water out of the end grain is going to help it last longer. So yeah. I think the wax is fine. You, your dad's probably right. It's eventually going to melt away or whatever, but it's better than yeah. nothing. Well, I, I, I found some information on a website, timberframehq.com, and they had a whole timberframe finishes, like, primer. What, <laughs> what did you learn? And they said, uh, I mean, they were, they were partial to um, penetrating oil finishes without a dry, drying component in it so that it has time to soak in mm -hmm. to the end grain. And they, and said, they said really the key is more than con being concerned with what the finish is, that you use something that is going to be easy to refurbish over time, that yeah. you don't have to do any scraping or It's got to be easier. People are not going to do anything. Yeah, you just, you just got to pick a finish that's, that's going to, with a little bit of soap and water down the road or just clean it, you know, yeah. light power washing. Something that's going to absorb, not like create a film on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've been talking to this gentleman about a feature article on um, uh, production timber framing. They actually have a shop that does lots of timber frames every year. And uh, his name is Ethan Biederman, and he works for South County Post and Beam, which is in uh, Rhode Island. And he said the sealant they like for um, timbers that won't be finished is something called Land Arc. And I went to the uh, website, and um, it seems like a very small operation, uh, although this guy um, has been doing this a long time. And I think if Ethan says it's good stuff, I, I believe him. So what's, what's the material then? It's a, it's a waxy-type finish. This guy specializes in um, finishes for timber framing. And um, once again, it's called uh, Land Arc Wood Finish. And that's the website, landarkwoodfinish.com. We'll put that on the podcast page uh, when at the end of the show. So is that basically is that actually just an end sealer, or that's a, a he has all he has finish? he has both. Okay, he has both. I mean, you know, the, I know the the guy's dad was it who was concerned about drying, but the, it seems like something flexible like a wax is just good because I mean the wood's going to move. So if you have some kind of hard finish that's dried on there, eventually you're going to get cracks in that finish. I would imagine, right? So yeah, something, and I would say try and build stuff so it naturally sheds water, right? If you can keep the end grain out of 
the rain and the snow, that's going to be even better. Yeah, that, that that's definitely key. I mean, I built a timber frame uh, pergola out of some oak and locust in my backyard. And um, one thing I wish I had done, and I think this probably would have made that it would have still been standing today, is a lot of times if you've got a flat surface that you're not going to be able to bevel or plane, that you just cap it with copper or, yeah. or zinc sheet metal. Yeah, and run it a little over the end with a bend down so it drips off of there. Mm-hmm. Plus, if you do, if you use zinc, it actually has some antimicrobial or you know sort of uh, almost like pesticide qualities, so that it'll keep any anything that might be rotting or molding the wood. The, the other thing that uh, Ethan said is to use uh, boric hair, which is a borate based wood preservative, and it's liquid. And um, borates uh, help prevent decay and insect damage. So, especially if you can let them soak and have that material taken up by the capillary tubes in the in the wood it's going to help a lot yeah. and i wouldn't be surprised if you couldn't go online and find some sort of homemade uh, diy recipes using borax for something I, I, like that i'm sure <laughs> there's a guy in um new orleans that i i've done articles with uh john davis who's a restoration carpenter and he buys these little borate um cylinders like they're probably half an inch in diameter and they come in different lengths and you you drill a hole and then you paint over them and it slowly releases the borates into the into the wood to prevent you know bugs and stuff from eating it when that's obviously a huge concern in his climate hmm. yeah the the one of the head of production guys at uh hudson valley preservation where andy Engel's working now mm-hmm. one of our former editors um more, the guys who run that company are into historic preservation and have lived in and worked on timber frame houses a lot. And uh, one of the guys, that's exactly what he did. He, I, remember I was helping him out working on his house one time, and we just drilled holes like every six inches or a foot in the sill beams on his house that were sitting right on a dry laid stone foundation and drilled those little plugs, and they just look like, you know, they look almost like wood pellets. You know, they're yeah. these long cylinders that you just jam in there. Hmm. Blake, send us a photo of your uh, timber-framed porch, won't you? Our next question comes from Hunter in Southern California. Hello, gentlemen. I come from a construction family. Dad is a general contractor. Mother, stepmother, and brother are all licensed tile setters. Uncle is a roofer. Grandpa is an OBGYN. Go figure. I've worked as a carpenter builder in some capacity my entire life, currently working in the film industry as a union prop maker and project manager. I'm an avid listener of your podcast, Review Your Magazine, as well as JLC and Fine Woodworking. I'm a huge fan of Mike Gurton and Christine Williamson, a lover of all nerdy building topics and practices. Well, welcome to the club, Hunter. I'm currently preparing to transition into running my own construction company. I'm ready to obtain my license. I've been speaking to numerous contacts regarding business and accounting in order to streamline the process of starting my own business and ensure I get what I want out of it. Throughout all this, I've been thinking a lot about others who are in the same boat, others who may not have all the resources, connections, or prior knowledge. Sure, you need the experience, but who is to say that the person you gained said experience from was setting a good example and using the best practices both in building and in business? Even studying for my exam has been a frustrating process. So many companies offer subpar study materials with blatant arrows, including typos, etc., all of which can be discouraging, especially to someone who doesn't know that when they say screening, they mean screeding. The audio CDs are even worse, dreary and slow, not spoken with any sort of cadence at all. He's making me a little self-conscious about how I'm reading this. <laughs> <laughs> Resources for business seem even further and few, farther and few between. Knowing the ins and outs of these decisions is so important to protecting yourself and being successful. And I would add doing a good job for your clients, right? Now, maybe I missed it, and maybe this is out there in the lost of the abyss of the Internet. However, it seems to me that if we want to keep craft alive, it would be a great benefit to have resources to help ease navigation of what is a difficult and potentially discouraging start for some. Study material that is clear, correct, and not difficult to acquire. Information on business that is related to construction and understandable to someone who doesn't speak the language. Even opportunities to have a consultation with somebody who's willing to take 15 minutes to quickly and clearly help one understand why an S-Corp isn't or is or isn't right for you. All I know is that for me, the process has been like trying to find an episode of FHB podcast that doesn't include the phrase air sealing. Well, we were doing fine until (laughs) he wrote this letter. 
Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. I honestly hope that this is a pointlessly written email and that the resources exist. However, if they don't, I know myself and hopefully others will be willing to contribute to the fine home building educational series, What the Hell Am I Doing and Is It Right? <laughs> Constructing a Business in Construction. Can we steal that? <laughs> it's pretty good, right? <laughs> Thank you for your time. And as always, keep craft alive. Well, that is a really good question. So I, I don't know how to exactly answer this, except I compiled my list of, I think, are good materials. But maybe you guys have other things that you would tell him besides research books. Well, before you get into some answers to the question, I have to say, I mean, that uh, it's it's exciting to see someone that's putting this much thought and yeah. effort and care into the into <laughs> these questions. I mean, this is what we're here for, and sometimes we get lost in like the same loop of s talking about the same topics over and over again. And and really, it's hearing from our readers and listeners that is the, the way for us to grow and to start trying to focus on the problems that are they're really having today. So, I. Yeah, <laughs> we are gonna. We are gonna certainly. What's carry, he saying? <laughs> well, I'm just saying we're we certainly gonna. We're certainly gonna look hard at this and uh, and try to share more of this types of information in the, in the future. So, what do you got? I got nothing. I didn't see this question. So you went. Until, you, you went to school. Yeah. For construction management. When? Well, no, for residential construction. So tell yeah. me, like, what do you learn in construction school? Uh, you learn how to build, sort of, to code. You know, we were learning sort of just, I wouldn't say just the basics. I mean, you start out with framing, you move on to finish, advanced framing, um, you know, trying to basically right-sizing your headers, right-sizing, you know, all of your floor framing, how to read all of the various tables for all the different things, how to read the code book, um, and, you know, all kinds of that stuff, but also how to build stairs, millwork. So, so more than nuts and bolts of residential construction, not running a construction business? Not really. I mean, we spent, I think, about half a semester um, <laughs> talking about, you know, the various types of businesses that you can set up and stuff like that. Um, but it's really specific, you know, I think to the state that you're in, maybe even the municipality, like what kind of licensing you need and stuff like that. Um, parts of New York State, for example, like don't require any kind of exact like licensing for <laughs> various think, kinds of contractors. I think a lot of the country that's the case. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, when I when I hear people say like, "Oh, I got to take this test," I'm like, "For what?" Like, mm. you know, because that's outside of the experience. <laughs> yeah. That I've had so far, but you know. Well, you know, the thing is, we have so many more resources available to us right now than. We did a generation ago as far as trying to find the answer even to 20 questions years like ago this. well yeah yeah even yeah just a handful of years ago every year it just seems like we have more but that also means that there's more to sift through to try to find what yeah, the and, really good information and for, is for every piece of good information there's dozens of uh dubious information yeah. i mean we've had a building business blog on our website for years now and uh different people have contributed to it over the years um I would say that Sean Van Dyke's articles on that blog are on par with what he's talking about, mm -hmm. about trying to figure out the best ways to build your business practices to be successful in business and what are what important things are to focus on. So uh, I'll certainly put some links to some of those blog posts in here. Um, I had to, this, this was uh, a very personal question for me. When I got out of college, the first thing I did was start a, uh, a home improvement business, right? I got magnet designs made for my truck. I bought a crossover toolbox and some tools, and I was a carpenter. And I didn't know anything, you know. Yeah. And I think that's a the very common experience, right? So I think back to what helped me the most, and it's not a plug. Fine home building was was the the, the resource when I was that age. Like there wasn't much else to look at. And later I discovered uh, JLC, which is another good magazine um, related to the craft of building houses. And uh, those were extremely helpful. And then in the subsequent years, there have been other materials that have helped me a lot. And one that I really like, and I'm not a contractor anymore, but uh, The Elements of Building by Mark Curson, who is a contractor. And the great thing about Mark's book is that they're like little lessons and you can be sitting in the truck waiting for an inspector or a subcontractor that you're meeting with. And you can read these things that are usually a few sentences to a few pages long. And boy, they really hit on all cylinders 
what uh, this guy describes his own experience and what has made him a better contractor, both in terms of being a better business person and doing a better job for your clients. Because I think those things go hand in hand to have a successful construction company. Because if you have a good business, but you're doing crappy work, no one's going to hire you. If you're doing good work, but can't run a business, you're going to be out of business. It seems like you have to learn both of those things at the same time. And it's evolutionary. You're not going to just know everything one day. And you you don't know like all you need to know 20 years later because you get new products and, uh, you know, the kind of people that we work with are building custom homes. Everyone is a prototype. There, there's no lessons to take uh, oftentimes to the next project. Yeah. And Hunter makes a good point. It's like, how do you know what is the right information or who are the good mentors? Uh, I mean, it nowadays you can go onto Instagram or wherever and find examples of people doing the work that is and similar to what you And it might even look great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Like, how do you judge whether... It yeah. may, it, just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd say you just got to use whatever means are comfortable to you to try to find those good mentors, to try to see what people are doing in your area, and maybe even find some local organizations, whether it's a business... Um, networking group or local NHB chapter or something like that where you're where you can actually start to get to know some of the people that are doing the kind of work that you that you re- appreciate but it takes experience it takes time I mean you, you people can give you information when you're 19 years old that you're just not going to be ready to to absorb into right. your experience so some of this just takes time and paying attention and just really keeping your eye out and searching for who's doing that good work and sharing that good information. And you, you got to use your best judgment to see what, what information is actually valuable to what your own situation. I got some other textbooks. Okay. So uh, running a successful construction company uh, is one title and Nail Your Numbers is another. Those are both by uh, David Gerstel. One is published by Taunton which is running a successful construction company and nail your numbers is not published by Taunton. I don't know who the publisher is of that, but those have both been cited by uh, many folks as being very helpful to their businesses. Um, one book I just got that is so fantastic. It is called water and buildings, an architect's guide to moisture and mold by William Rose. So I've put off buying this book cause it's a hundred bucks for, I think more than 10 years. Right. Yeah. I think it came out in 2006. Yeah. Um, I was always scared off by the hundred dollar price tag, but recently I bought it on Amazon for sixty dollars, and I don't know. If oh, lucky! It, yeah, I don't know if that's still the case, but not only is this book uh, a wealth of information on building science, but it is very entertaining to read. It is not dry. <laughs> Running water and buildings, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just fun. So what I learned about this, I, I, so I look like I, I read a lot of nonfiction is I read things that catch my attention. I'm not, I'm not one to read that kind of book cover to cover. I just don't have it in me, but I learned that French d- drains, do you know where the, the origin of that? No. So the first treatise on drainage for construction was called, I think it was called farm drainage. And it was written by this guy French in, uh, 1865. Mm. And so that's the origin of a French drain. It's not because it comes from France. It's not, it's this guy's name. So right. I, I learned that. I never knew that origin of that. And yeah. this book is full of like fascinating tidbits like that. Um, the other one's great if you're actually doing jobs once you get to that point is the Code Check series, and that's by Taunton too. Uh, we've talked about those on the, on the show before. Uh, extremely valuable to know what you're doing is going to be allowed by the inspector. It's super uh, easy to reference, like it's organized by the various sub trades in the in the um, in the residential process, and you can look up you know things from like how many circuits do you need in the kitchen, like what ampicity they need to be, all this stuff, uh, and it's it's really easy to to look up and get information quickly. Yeah, it's like a, it, it condenses important parts of the code and explains it in much simpler language, <laughs> and it's visual. Yeah, yeah. And I put on here, and you called me on this, Matt, before we started recording. Um, I put on here the IRC. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not because I'm a huge fan. It's just because I think you need to look up stuff all the time. Yeah. And you can you can get it online. Free. Free. 
all of it. Yeah, like if you just search around, it you may not be able to go to the IRC website and just click on it and it pops up for free, um, you know, the latest version or whatever. But if you search around enough, you'll find a link. Yeah, there are some portals that basically break it down into all of its tiny little parts. And so you can't just sit there and read a chapter, but you can you can go bit by bit or look up very specific uh, questions. And you, you can go on the IRC and actually read it chapter by chapter <laughs> if you want. You just have to oh, find the link. Oh, you want to. It's yeah. going to be the, very scintillating. Yeah, <laughs> and actually they just changed their interface within the last few weeks, I think, because um, I'm on that website all the time looking up various things. And uh, it's it's different navigation now, but it's kind of easier navigation. So I would say definitely I would say a hint website. for using uh, the free versions uh, and there are many incarnations out there on the web is to when you do a Google search or a web search, do IRC and then the subject you want to look for. And invariably somewhere it's going to pop up the exact section that you can either look in your own book or then go to the IRC, uh, the ICC website to look up the actual uh, document. Yeah. What do you think? So it's a, it's an investment, right? So you can get the current copy of the 2018 IRC for 144 bucks. Uh, there's also the version with the commentary, and that's the one I prefer. Um, it costs more, two hundred and sixty six dollars. So it's another one hundred and twenty two over the normal version, but it often describes the why behind the code. Uh, sections. So, so, so that's like getting like the director's cut version of a movie. It is, uh, <laughs> yeah. and sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. But it's it's worth. Uh, it gives you a little more insight into the why. Yeah, mostly for the changes. I don't know if it yeah. really talks about the the whys for stuff that's been in the code forever. But for sometimes, anytime, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But every time there's a change, like it kind of explains it, and that's. And oftentimes the 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 wording, the verbiage is easier to understand in the in the commentary than it is in the actual code section it's right like you can use this to understand what they're really trying to say yeah because it's written in plain language instead of some carefully crafted language that has to, that can't be misinterpreted basically yeah the rest of it seems like it was written by a bot <laughs> that's it the only is. part that seems like it was written i don't by know a why person. it's so unintelligible but yeah. I, it's yeah it's got to be very difficult writing uh, you know a reference book with hundreds of people in on the process mm-hmm can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, if you, not that anybody wants to do this, but if you look at like the comments that people submit for like changes to the code at any point in time, if you've <laughs> got really nothing else to do and <laughs> you're thinking about maybe, I don't know, hurting yourself, then <laughs> consider doing It's an this. option. It's an option. Um, I also said Green Building Advisor because like the wealth of knowledge on that site and you have uh, assembly details to help you do a good job with even weird building scenarios. Like what is that, $100 a month, Rob? $100 uh, a, a year. A year gets you all of the access to the drawing library that they have there, which has lots of great building science details. details. And, uh, you know, a, a deeper en encyclopedia of, of basic gr green building and building science concepts, plus access to some of the, the richer articles. Um, and, of course, turn to the Q&A forum there, just like ours. The one thing about uh, we're going to hopefully get more of our staff or contributors into our forum soon to give, give you know, some helpful insight into some of the questions that people have in there. But on Green Building Advisor, I've never experienced a forum that is as rich and useful as that group of people. If you and, have a question. so responsive. It, yeah. Within it, <laughs> yeah. Every question hours. I've ever asked has been answered by multiple people. If knowledgeable not, people. No, very yeah. knowledgeable people who are very generous with their time and information and experience. Very true. And, uh, and very uh, many different fields related to construction, from architects to engineers to uh, and builders. And I think it's that wealth of experience that really adds to those discussions on that site, because oftentimes there's someone who raises a point that nobody else had thought of, right? Because they just have a different experience or a different, you know, um, part of the residential building process. Sure, and and you know, de depending on the region and the and the people's uh, mm -hmm. building philosophies and reasons for doing some of the things they they are doing. There can be some arguments on there, but they're very objective, constructive, valuable and the, bits of information. The site is well moderated, so you don't have trolling and and silliness that you get so many places. Yeah, it's not like hanging out on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. But but so just like many people feel that 
they come to us just for insulation, air sealing, and old house problem <laughs> questions. Um, we can do a lot more than that. Same thing with those forums is that uh, any type of building-related question, whether it's business-related or, yeah. you know, family dispute related. <laughs> <laughs> we need more of those. That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, to, don't hesitate to ask those sorts of questions. Do you have any uh, favorite uh, books that you think help someone be a better builder? <sighs> I don't know. You can get to get Audell's. <laughs> Do they still print those? I don't know if they still print them, but I found a copy, or it, like the, the full four book set at a, at a book sale somewhere. It can't ago. be current, though, Matt. No, it's not. I mean, you have to be worried about that kind of stuff because it just was written in a different... I mean, it's going to get you the code, but yeah. I mean, it's going to show you how old people used to build houses in the old days. <laughs> what was that book that I found you at the thrift store, <laughs> Patrick? Uh, it was just a, a construction textbook, I think, right? Yeah, from, and it comes from the 50s? I'm not sure if it was quite that old. I think it was like... Maybe 60s, 60s or 70s. 70s. Oh. The thing that was I observed was that like, the interior finishes that they kept showing were so impossibly hideous, <laughs> oh so ugly, as an ugly period of time. Oh, a roof cutter's secrets. That's a good one. That's a good one. It's, yeah. If you're going to do your own framing, that's indispensable. Yeah. What, you, what, has there any, been any text that... Uh... Oh, I've been so immersed in the website that I've, I don't find as much time to read books as I would like to Well, there must recently. have been something that you've, you've consulted in your many years in this wacky business. My many years. Uh, I mean... It, we've talked about this before, I think, but uh, a pattern language. It's uh, it yeah. sometimes yeah, reads for design. A, yeah. It reads a little bit like the code book, but a little bit more, a uh, <laughs> little bit more artfully written. Uh, but it's you know, <laughs> if the code was on acid, that's what that's what it sounds like. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a group of people that basically did a, a thorough research of building throughout time around the globe and tried to identify patterns that make buildings work for people, that make them comfortable and practical to live in. That's a great book, no doubt. Yeah. Um, Charlie Wing, uh, I think it's called the Illustrated, Illustrated Guide to Building. It was originally a Taunton book, but I, I don't think Taunton's produced it for a long time, but... I think it's still in print and by the different publisher, but I found that one very helpful when I was a construction supervisor at Habitat for Humanity because it had like really practical things like how to wire a three and four way switch, you know, um, span tables, uh, you know, like how to uh, book your shingles so you you have the maximum uh, coverage with the fewest uh, aligning aligned seams, you know. Just really super good practical information, and it had a good index, which is like something that's very useful when you have a reference book. I would say, sure, got to have a good index. Yeah, you're looking for other stuff. Yeah, there's another book, and I know this sounds cheesy as heck, but we actually used this some in school. It was like the Black and Decker. I think it's called the Book of Home Improvement or something like that, and it does have like some. It, it, it's all like code, you know, mm -hmm. approved stuff. Um, but yeah, we used it a lot for electrical stuff because it shows you how to wire all kinds of circuits, and it's that part of it at least was help, helpful. And I haven't been through the rest of the book to know if it if it was worth it. But I think I paid like a buck eighty one for it on Amazon. So <laughs> <laughs> what's not to like? What's not to like? Exactly. <laughs> That's cool. Well, that was a great question. I, uh, I I I expect we'll put all these books up on the podcast page. Definitely, and we'll and we'll and we'll kind of dig into his because this is a nice, long, well-written letter that he sent to us, and I'm going to seriously look at that to, you know, for inspiration for stuff for us to cover in the future. Cool. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thanks to Matt and Rob for joining me, and Jeff, and thanks to all of you for listening. Remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us. However, you're listening, it helps other folks find our podcast. Happy building. Keep craft alive. Thanks again for listening.